This is the last week in our series on the parables, and I'm not going to talk about a parable. How about that? For the last week of a series on parables, you'd never even have known if I hadn't told you, but I thought I would tell you anyway. We're going to be talking about a story that Jesus told that really happened that I talked about last week that was an illustration for the parable of the 10 virgins, and it's a story that caused a lot of controversy among some of you, at least a lot of questions. A lot of you, or many of you, and then some people who reached out to me online, um, ask some questions about this particular story. And I think it's important for us before we move on uh, to really be clear, to drive home the point that Jesus was trying to make when he talked about the rich, young ruler. If you were here last week, you remember that I told you I was neither or am neither rich nor young nor a ruler. But to talk to you about what the people who had heard this or witnessed this firsthand would have been thinking about or would have seen, I want to explain to you a little bit about the context or setting behind this Luke chapter 18 passage. So as we look together at Luke chapter 18, a certain ruler asked Jesus a question. Now this passage or this story is found in three gospels. It's found in Mark, it's found in Matthew, and also in Luke. Each of the gospels adds some detail. None of them conflict with each other, of course, because scripture is absolutely true. But the three different gospels together are very clear that this is a rich, a young, and a ruler. A rich man, a young man, and a ruler. Now, a rich man would have been somebody, if they were young, who would have inherited their money from their family, and they would have been managing an estate, expected to manage well, to pass on the money to the next generation, and so it would have been generational wealth. A young man in Jesus' day, and it's very uh, different than our day, because um, many of you would say, I'm young, and then I look at some of you guys and say, you're young, and young is all relative, right? I mean, what is it? 30 is the new 10, and 50 is the new 30. I mean, we have all kinds of crazy different sayings now. In Jesus' day, you were considered young if you were at least 25 and you were under 40. So we know that this man was at least 25, and he was under the age of 40. He was considered young. He was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. Now, the ruler would have been a leader of the synagogue. He was the chief of the church. He was the guy in charge. He was the one who called the shots, the shot caller at the local synagogue. And that's who had come to Jesus. And in Mark, it tells us that this man came running to Jesus and that he knelt at his feet and he asked him a question. And the question he asked him was, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the word good is uh, an important word. It's agathon. And this particular word in the Greek means perfectly, spiritually, intrinsically, morally good. If I was to say to you um, that Lori Shouse is my good friend, um, you would know that she's good, but she, even though she's really good, she is not perfectly, morally, intrinsically, spiritually good, right? She lacks a little bit. The only per- person who's spiritually, morally, intrinsically good is Jesus Christ or God, the Father. Back in this time, people would have certainly assumed that that was the case. So he was um, calling him good teacher. The word good was very significant. It was a man of some prestige, some notoriety, uh, some respect responsibility. And he came to Jesus and asked this very important question. And he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And there are a few things that are good about this man. The first one is, is he came with the right question. Even though he had everything, he knew that he lacked something. He was searching. That he came to the right place, to the right person. He came with intensity, with urgency. That when he came, it required at least some sort of humility. And when he arrived at Jesus, he was looking for an answer. Clearly, you're a person who is close to God. I'm a person who also is close to God, this man would be inferring. So tell me what it is that I must do to inherit eternal life. Now, this is problematic right here. These two words, I do. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now put that in the back of your mind. We're gonna keep going. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony and honor your father and mother. It was my favorite one. Um, My boys may be listening. That's a good commandment. Although we're not under the 10 commandments the same way that they were in the Old Testament, they certainly are good principles for us to live by. 
This man was basing his faith on the fact that he had followed the rules. He checked the boxes. He was a good person. He knew all the answers. If you played Bible trivia with him, he would beat you every single time. He was um, a person of influence. He was a person that would have been considered religious. If you had a question about something in your life, you, would have might, you might have gone to this man and asked for advice because he looked the part. And, um, you know, he, Jesus is reminding this guy that there's a standard in the Old Testament. Let's continue looking at the scriptures. And the, the, the man says, yes, all of these things I have kept since I was a boy. We discussed that in detail last week. These three words, I have kept. What must I do? Problematic. What must I do? These things I have kept. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Now, Jesus wants everything from us, not just some things. And many of us hold things back. And that's where we had some discussion that came from last week's message. Why should I give everything to Jesus? I mean, everything. Many people hold something back. Many people before they become Christians or as they're considering becoming a Christian, a follower of Christ, when they realize that you come to Christ and give him everything you are and you have and you want to become. Why? It's kind of jealous, isn't it? Kind of demanding. Fair questions, the why questions. The why questions never stress me out. It's the questions you don't ask that, that stress me out. And I've experienced this tension firsthand with people, a lady that I talked with years ago, wanted to become a believer. She'd heard the, the gospel. She'd been in our services for a while. And she came to me and she said, I want to get, I want to get, I want to become a Christian. I want to get saved. I want to be a follower of Christ. So we talked and, and I said, so are you ready to, to follow Jesus? And she said, well, yeah, I'm ready, but there's one thing. And I said, what's that one thing? And she said, I hate my husband's guts and I'm getting a divorce. And even if I become a Christian, there's no way I'm not getting a divorce. Now, some people get divorced. Sometimes there's nothing that a person can do about it. Sometimes there are biblical reasons or grounds. This lady didn't have any. She just didn't like him and was annoyed with him and just wanted out. And she said, um, I'll become a Christian, but I'm not giving God my marriage. And I said, you got to give the Lord everything. You have to at least give him the possibility to do a miracle. I don't know if things will work out or not, but you can't keep it from him. And you know what she said to me? No, thank you. And she walked away. For some, it could be our finances, our business, our plans for the future, like this particular rich young ruler. For some, it could be sexuality. For some, it could be a relationship that you wanna have. But Jesus wants everything. He wants our heart. And this man had it here. And he had it here, but he didn't have it here. And Jesus pinpointed the one thing he had. And he said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Now, people in Jesus' day believed that rich people were blessed by God, that they had been blessed that God had given them money and they had a fast track to heaven. They thought poor people had been cursed by God. And the more a person gave to the church, the more people assumed they had favor with God. And it was literally a situation where uh, you could buy your way in uh, to good favor with God in a place in heaven. And so this rich man's example has little to do with money more than it has to do with the imagery behind what people assumed toward a rich person. But what it represents to us is the one thing that we have in our lives that we're not willing to give to God. And we ask the question, is it really worth it? Should I really, does he really deserve it? Is that really what it takes? And so Jesus said, listen, you have one thing that you lack, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And this man looked at Jesus and he said, no, thank you. Now it was a lot to ask because he had responsibilities, a family, standing in the community, people who were kind of counting on him. It was a lot to ask, but Jesus said, trust me with everything. And when the man heard this, he looked at Jesus, 
he became very sad. And in Mark, it says, and Jesus loved him out of pity or just his heart was breaking because he was very wealthy and said, no, thank you. So Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? How hard is it for a person who will not come to Jesus with everything to enter the kingdom of God? How hard is it for a person who wonders if it's worth it, who wonders if Jesus deserves it, who's not quite sure? And it's a fair question, one we'll spend some time on in just a minute. But as we close this up, I want to point out a couple things. Where did he go wrong? First of all, the Old Testament law was supposed to reveal his need for God, but instead it concealed his sin because he became very legalistic and very focused on the fact that he was a good person, that he kept those rules, those laws. 100%? Well, no, of course not, but most of the time, and most of the time was good enough, and good enough certainly should be good enough, and so he was a good person, and when he died, surely the cosmic scale would be tipped in his favor when the good and the bad were weighed, and ultimately he would slide right in because he had favor, after all, with God because of his standing. And so he used the very law that was given to show us the impossible standard to measure up to God's expectation, and he used it as camouflage. And the second thing is he believed that following the law could save him and not following Jesus. Now, there was something in him that knew that he wasn't going to have an eternal life. He had a restlessness of the soul. All of his faith was put in things that he caused or created or was a part of by birth. He was self-righteous, felt like he brought something to the table. And when Jesus said, leave it all behind and follow me, he said, no, thank you. And he went back to clinging to the rules that he kept and to the fact that he was better at keeping them than most people. Self-righteousness. Well, self-righteousness is something that plagues many of us. And whenever my perspective on someone or something becomes a part of my identity, particularly my spiritual identity, I become self-righteous. Whenever my perspective changes my behavior toward a group of people or others, I certainly become self-righteous. And this man, as much as he was asking good questions, as much as he was in a place where Jesus, had he been a modern day evangelist, would have said, just pray the prayer, just sign the card, just join the church, just get baptized, not even worry about it. Jesus took him to the root, to the heart of the matter. And he said, if you don't come with all of you, then you're really coming with none of you. And it leaves the question, and all of us, by the way, are self-righteous. Why? Is he that jealous? Is he that demanding? Does he really deserve it? Do I really want to stake everything on Jesus? Now, I believe the reasonable answer is yes. I believe the wise answer is yes. I believe the life-changing answer is yes. But this rich, young ruler believed the answer was no. And he walked away and it left the disciples who were watching with a huge conundrum, with a problem. And that's the problem that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Let's look here together at the continuation of Luke chapter 18. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for the self-righteous or for the rich in this case to enter the kingdom of God? He said, indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom. Has anyone ever heard this whole eye of the needle thing? Has anyone, you churchies like me, have you ever heard anybody say the eye of the needle and the camel and give explanations? And I want to just see a raise, just by a show of hands. Okay, there are several of you out there. For those who haven't, it's just weird things that churchy people like to talk about and think about. And the eye of the needle is a, is a, a word or a use of phrase that has confused many Christians over the years. And, and I just want to see if I can bring a little clarity to that right now. 
But, you know, Jesus is looking uh, up at him and them and said, it's really difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. He said, in fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And there are three different real views of this eye of the needle. One, that Jesus was speaking and that translators mistranslated the word camel for, and it should have been cable. And it's much easier for a cable to go through the eye of the needle. And um, so that means that, you know, it's hard because you have to line it up, but not impossible. And people were trying to help Jesus with his interpretation, not satisfying. Number two, uh, it was that people said that there was a tiny little door to the gate of Jerusalem that they called the eye of the needle and that uh, camel could go through if it got down on its hands and knees and just sort of made its way through. And uh, you'd have to take off all the packs and things. And a lot of Christians for a long time believed that. But the reality is that archaeologists and historians cannot turn up any evidence whatsoever that there was any such thing as a gate in, or a door to the external gates of the city of Jerusalem called the, the Eye of the Needle. And so the analogy there is true and accurate that it's exceptionally difficult, but yet history doesn't support it. Um, the third option is that Jesus was simply using a figure of speech um, there were other rabbis in different parts of the, the Middle Eastern world where they had elephants who would use the same saying. And they would say something is as difficult as an elephant going through the eye of a needle. Um, they didn't happen to have elephants in Palestine. Camels were the biggest animal. And so that was the analogy. Most likely Jesus is saying that it's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle just like it is impossible for the self-righteous person to enter the kingdom of God. For the person who's focused on what can I do to inherit eternal life, all of these things I have kept since I was a child, that it's impossible. And so the disciples would have received this. They would have gotten it. They would have been like, all right, but we've seen you establish relationships with people and not ask them to do something so extreme. And what Jesus was asking isn't something that we all would have to do to go sell everything. It is an example that Jesus is using to reveal the condition of the heart. And so as the conversation continues, um, those who heard it, they said, who can be saved then? And then Jesus replied, what's impossible with man is possible with God. You get it? It's impossible for a man to save himself or a woman. Impossible. We offer nothing. But we want to be able to offer something because we don't like to owe anybody anything. I went to the fair on Friday with Pastor Dan and Lori and my sweet wife, Joy. And uh, I know last week I said I was going to try to avoid the fair and I don't like crowds. And famous last words, do you know that Lori, Pastor Dan's wife, had never been to a state fair in her entire life up until Friday? Um, she, like my wife, grew up on a farm and they lived the Iowa State Fair. So they thought, why would I go to the Iowa State Fair and pay 16 bucks to see animals that I had to feed growing up or be around or smell? Um, but we went and, um, you know, we were walking in and, and uh, Dan and Lori and Joy, they had to go to the bathroom. Now I share that because it's relevant, right? And so they slipped into the bathrooms before we even got into the gate. And I thought, I'm going to do something nice. Now you can't really tell people if you do something nice because it doesn't count, right? But I'm going to tell you any I don't care if it counts or not. I went up to the gate and I was going to buy our tickets to go in. So I hand them my credit card. You know, of course, they had a hard time, you know, with the numbers and stuff. And I'm waiting for, I wanted to have the tickets before they came out of the bathroom. And so sure enough, you know, they came out of the bathroom. I had the tickets. I walked up and handed Dan his two tickets. And he goes, what? You know, what's the deal? And I said, oh, they were buy one, get one free today. Now that's just a little church lie, just a lie among friends. It wasn't buy one, get one free. He was way too smart to believe that. And I said, no, it's fine. You know, just let's go to the fair. And uh, I heard Dan mutter under his breath. I'm not going to owe anybody anything. And I'm like, oh, great. Here we go. So a little later in the fair, we're hanging out, you know, we're doing fair things. And I feel two fingers in my front pocket. Now that is a bad feeling to feel at the state fair. Under any circumstances, in a crowd, you don't want to feel no fingers in your pocket. And I look up and Dan's shoving money in my pocket. Now, thank goodness it was Dan because Dan or Joy, the only ones there that could have done that and gotten away with it. Um, but I looked down, I pulled out, it was $40. It wasn't even $32. And I didn't have any change. So I made $8 for doing something nice for somebody just for letting them into the fair. But the point is, we don't want to owe anybody anything. And we want to feel like we pay our own way. We want to feel like we have something to offer. And friends, our lives before Christ are not insignificant. Many people have accomplished a lot 
as this rich young ruler had. Our lives before Christ are incomplete. And instead of this man looking at Jesus saying, yes, I need you to complete me. So what I have done, although I believe significant, not enough, incomplete. So I give it to you to use me the way you want to use me. And the disciples, they said, if you wouldn't let this guy into heaven, who can get saved? And Jesus says, with man, it's impossible. But through God, yeah, all things are possible. So why is it impossible for man? Let's look at that together. We were dead in our trespasses, our transgressions and our sins. We were born destined for hell. We used to live in a way that was consistent with the ruler of the kingdom of the air here in this life on this world, disobedient to God. All of us also lived among each of these people at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving wrath. We were all born sinful. We've all fallen short of God's glory and we were all unable to pay the debt. There is no way we could buy our tickets into the fair. Impossible. With man, impossible. Dead in our transgressions and sins. How dead? Totally dead. Unable to respond. So with God, how is it possible? But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Now, do you see any I in this? No. What can I do? All of these things I have kept, none of these things would help. But because of God's great love for us, he's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Because it's by grace we've been saved. Now, many people ask the question, is it enough? Should I really give Jesus my entire life? Why does he deserve everything? Because God gave us everything that we didn't deserve and could never get on our own. Let me put it a different way. Do you, how many have kids in here, by the way? Raise your hands. I got kids, I got one good one, I have two kids. Now. The reason I say that is only one of them is good at a time. They go back and forth all the time. Uh, one's good one day, one's good the next day. You get what I mean. I'm not a bad kid and a good kid. It's just one's usually good. The other one, you know, um, they're old though. They're, they're in their twenties. They're men. And, um, you know, I would do anything I can do to keep them from pain, from making mistakes. When as an adult, uh, me parenting adult kids, you know, I try to, to give advice, try to influence, try to nudge, um, try to help when they make big life decisions. And when you see things coming that you know are going to be bad decisions and you try to make them make the right choice and you see them make a choice that you wouldn't make and you know it's probably not going to work out, not big things, but things, you know, and then they make the choice and it doesn't work out and they come to you and they're like, oh, dad, I have no idea why this didn't work out. And you just want to grab them through the phone and just give them a little strangle and say, because you didn't do what I told you to do. And the reason we know no, the reason we know it's not going to work out is because we've done those things. And we would try to keep our kids from the things that we have done at any cost. And I certainly would want to keep my kids from the things that, that you have done. I mean, we don't even sometimes pass on good genetic traits to our kids. I remember when Richard was in third grade, he was playing basketball. And um, I'm sitting next to my wife, who doesn't normally say things like this. And she went, oh, no. And I said, what, Joy? He was dribbling, you know, like third graders do all over the place and, you know, stumbling and it's fun. She goes, oh, no. And I said, what? She goes, well, I'm not going to say it. And I said, well, you have to say it because you started to say it. And she said, no, I better not say it. You're going to get mad. And I said, now I'm mad because you're not saying it and you started to say it. So you say it and I won't get mad. And you know what? I got mad. But this is what she said. She said, I can't believe Richard got your knees. That's what she was upset about. And I had never in my life been self-conscious about my knees until that day. I mean, no one ever looked at me and said, you're going to be a knee model. But I never looked at my knees and thought they're hideous. I must have reconstructive surgery. It just never occurred to me. But even our genetic traits were like, oh, no, we passed them on, you know, to our kids. We'll do anything to keep our kids from pain. 
But do you understand that, that God the Father loved us so much that he took his only son, Jesus Christ. Let me put it this way. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to take on sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus never committed any sins, but God the Father treated him like he had committed every single sin. I mean, don't even think about trying to keep your child from, from having to experience sin. He treated him like he had committed every single one of them. The little ones and the big ones and everyone in between because the tickets had to be purchased by somebody and it was with a currency that we did not and do not possess. And so then the second part of this verse even gets more personal. And we see that so that in Jesus, we might become right with God. God the Father punished Jesus just like he lived my life life and like he deserved punishment and friends if it were me and it would have cost me that to save you you're not getting in the fair that he treated Jesus who didn't deserve it like he had lived my life like he'd lived your life, like he'd said all of the terrible things, thought all of the terrible thoughts, done all of the disgusting acts, everything that any of us could ever do. And do you know what? That's not enough. There's even more. God the Father treats me and you in Jesus just like we lived the life Jesus did. And friends, we didn't. And that's what grace and mercy offer us that he sees you through the eyes of Jesus because he punished Jesus for the sins that we've committed the sins of the world and the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord so this rich young ruler thought I'm rich I'm young and I'm a ruler I have too much to live for to give myself to Jesus. How wrong could a person be? What better choice could a person make? The most important choice or decision that you and I will ever make, the decision we make about Jesus Christ. So what should this rich young ruler have done? He should have confessed his sin and asked for forgiveness. He should have believed who Jesus is and that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. That nobody comes to the Father except through him, but that anyone who wants to come can come. Anyone who wants to come can come. Why? Because he paid the price for your sin. God punished him for the life you've lived and will forgive you and treat you like you never lived that life. That you believe who Jesus is. And that you want to follow him as his disciple with everything you have, all of your resources, all of your intellect, all of your ability, all of your future. And then your significance becomes complete because that's what God's love, his mercy, and his grace does for people like you and like me. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent this morning and this powerful story, it's tragic in some ways, but yet so challenging and exciting in others. It makes us think. We examine our hearts. To be perfectly truthful, Father, it breaks my heart. I don't possess the kind of love that would have required what you chose to do for me. And I cannot imagine 
the price that she paid. I'm so grateful that Jesus lived a perfect life, never sinning and never making a mistake, but yet taking on my sin, our sin, dying on the cross, rising again three days later, defeating sin, Satan and death once and for all, so that any of us who put our faith and trust in him, why wouldn't we? Wouldn't perish, but have meaning and significance and hope in this life and the guarantee of heaven to come. I pray, Father, that we hang on to this truth, this gospel truth, that we live it as best we're able with your help, that we nudge our friends who may not know you toward this truth, that you are the one who changes lives. You change cities, you change states and countries, you can change our world. And you're waiting to come back. So we wanna be part of what it is that you're doing. This is our message because of Jesus and in Jesus' name, amen.